You know, one of the most important aspects of mediumship is evidence. How do you prove that you're talking to someone that has crossed over or a being that's unseen by the majority of people on the planet? Well, evidence comes in many forms. Mark Pitstick, author of Soul Proof, came on our show and talked about 10 ways to prove the continuation of life. And I've discussed evidentiary mediumship in the mediumship one and two episodes. And if and the, these and Mark's episode can be found on my YouTube channel. If you're curious about those, just go to YouTube, put in Medium Tracy Lockwood. That's Tracy with an E-Y, Medium Tracy Lockwood. But today's guest is a ghostorian. And you're all like, say what? You heard me right, ghostorian. And so what you may well ask is a ghostorian. Um, well, it's basically someone who has combined paranormal investigation and historical research and also created proof of the continuation of life. Uh, Mike Ricksecker is the author of the historic paranormal books Ghosts of Maryland, Ghosts and Legends of Oklahoma, Campfire Tales, Midwest and Ghostorian Case Files, Volume 1. And there's kind of a genre of historic paranormal books. He's appeared on multiple TV shows and programs, as well as paranormal. In addition to being a paranormal historian, he was included in Animal Planet's The Haunted and Bio Channel's My Ghost Story. He has been on two Fox stations, Fox 5 News in Washington, D.C., and Fox 25 News out of Oklahoma City. He produces his own internet shows on ghosts and legends and paranormal roads. And recently, he has founded his own paranormal and supernatural publishing company. It's called Haunted Road. He has written several historic paranormal articles, and he's widely published. He's been published in the Baltimore Sun Paranormal Underground Magazine, and he wrote a paranormal column in Oklahoma for the Examiner. His work has been featured in the Oklahoman, the Frederick News Post, and he has really been honored because Marshall University's The Parthenon has also featured his work, and Louisiana State University's Civil War book review includes his books and his um, information. He's also an Amazon best-selling mystery author, and he has two entries in his Chase Michael DeBarlow private detective series, Deadly Heirs and System of the Dead. And so he's got over 20 years of experience. He's served as a paranormal investigator and ghostorian with the Society of the Supernatural, and he travels about speaking and writing and doing paranormal research, and uh, welcome, Mike. We're glad to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Tracy. Yeah, I really appreciate the intro for you having me on today. Oh, well, thank you for being here. So I want to go ahead and announce uh, your websites just in case people would like to jot them down. HauntedRoadMedia.com and MikeRickSecker.com, and people are like, uh, Rick, Rick what? It's Rick yeah. <laughs> Secker, R-I-C-K-S-E-C-K-E-R, Rick Secker, Rick Secker. Very good. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about you. Uh, who, who, uh, who is Mike Rick Secker? <laughs> <laughs> who is Mike Rick Secker? Who is he? <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'm mean, I'm a writer, I'm an author, I'm a paranormal investigator, I'm a historian, I'm a videographer, um, I do a little bit of everything. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of traveling lately. <laughs> um, I mean, really, I started in all of this. You know, as far as writing, I've been writing since I was in second grade. It's always been a, a passion of mine. Uh, I started off primarily with, with mystery stories. I loved the Encyclopedia Brown books as a kid, and I wanted to mimic those, and so I was trying to you know, write my own little mysteries. Uh, and I wrote some, you know, paranormal short stories as well, some little ghost stories. And I also wrote, you know, this is the history angle. I also wrote these little uh, stories. I was in Massachusetts when I was young. And so we did a lot on the Revolutionary War. 
Yeah. Um, big focus there. And so I was writing these little stories um, from, it was basically a uh, George Washington and his lieutenant talking back and forth and then about the different battles. And I drew little stick figures of, of the battle. So that's kind of always been with me is, is the writing aspect, but also, you know, the mystery, the paranormal, the, the history, you know, all of that has been with me uh, throughout the last <laughs> 40 years. So, uh, yeah, it's very yeah, just, interesting that connection between writing mystery stories, um, which are one of my top favorite types of books to read when I get a chance to do that, and the mysteries of the unseen world. That's a very unusual combination. Well, to me, they kind of go hand in hand because there's so much that we don't know about the afterlife, and you know, we're, we're trying to discover those secrets, but even. While, you know, I'll just use an example here. Um, recently did some investigating at uh, an old grade school in Kansasville, Illinois. And you know, we were getting you know, all kinds of footsteps from what seemed like the second floor, but there's no second floor to this school. We even went up in there and, you know, it's just attic space, you know, just, you know, um, blown insulation. There's no second floor, but we heard like, bootsteps on heavy wooden floor. So, it caused us to wonder, okay, was there a building here prior to the school that maybe there was a house or something like that where somebody could be walking along the floor and maybe this is a, a residual haunt. Hmm. So that caused us to start really uh, you know, diving into the history of the town, of the location. Um, Shana Wankel uh, is the one that got me into this school and she, she used to live there as a school she actually attended and so you know she was you know asking her father asking around town you know doing a lot of that type of leg work and you know i was diving into i was diving into old maps online and um you know back to the old land plats and you know trying to discover what had been there you know a hundred years ago uh, to see if something had predated the school and so it really is investigative work um you know, that there's really you know, a number of mysteries that go along with this, you know, not just the afterlife, but also, you know, the history of the town and the school and the locations and all that. Yeah, that's, that is, that is right. And it's an interesting point for you all that are listening, that if you're having an occurrence, that it could be something that predates the existing structures. I find that very interesting. And I know in doing house readings, sometimes I encounter that like layers of cultures and different structures that have been in that one location. And it's, it's interesting to sort it out because, you know, of course we live in the physical world and we're seeing the material structure that's around us and thinking like you did, like, How's that possible? There's no part of the place that's like that. And very interesting that it was auditory, too, that there were sounds that could be heard that echoed back to that prior structure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a, a lot of dynamics that we were picking up there, mostly auditory. Um, but, you know, there were some uh, shadows that were seen there. And one thing that we could not explain was um, the last time that I was there, we came in on a, on a Saturday. She had just been there the day before on a Friday. And sometime between there, there was a folding chair in the gymnasium that somehow got crumpled up. And we're not sure Whoa. how in the world that happened. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. Some pretty intense energy. Yeah there. Could you clarify just for our listeners the name of the person? I just want to clearly spoken so that it's on the record there. Uh, the person, oh, that yes. I was working with her? Oh, uh, Shana Wankel? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, so I guess that was an, it was a natural link for you about some of the things that you were encountering, which <laughs> I want to say, which came first, the chicken or the egg, but it sounds like maybe your paranormal encounters became... <laughs> the, the genesis or <laughs> did you write before you i i well I, that's a good question um because i had experiences when i was a child and the, 
the one uh, that was clearly the most distinct, um, I was about eight or nine years old, and I started writing when I was seven. So looking at that, yeah, my writing would predate that event, uh, which was with the shadow person. But there was one other event that was probably around that same time, around seven years old, that maybe even six. Now, I'm not sure if it was a paranormal experience or not, so I don't count it at this point, but it was you know, all there around my childhood. Yeah. Now, um, some people that are listening have seen shadow people. How would you describe a shadow person, and what do you mean specifically by that term? Well, there's a lot of different varieties of, of shadow people. I know there's some tr- strong opinions um, within the community uh, about what shadow people are. My personal take is that they're interdimensional beings. Um, my first experience with a shadow person, and I've had a lot of different experiences, uh, both good and bad. Well, my first experience with a shadow person, I was about eight or nine years old, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and it was standing in the corner of my room, you know, between the window and my closet. Um, this dark humanoid figure couldn't really make out any features. I was terrified as a, as a child. And this is where a lot of people take the um, experience to, well, you know, sleep paralysis, you're hallucinating, all that. Mm. However, my story is a little different in that this shadow person actually came up to me, approached me, bent over my bed, took my arms and crossed them across my body. Still have no idea to this day why, but Mm -hmm. it did touch me and manipulate my arms. And then it ran down the hall into the linen closet and I watched it and it turned my head and watched it go. So, you know, I was able to physically move. My arms were crossed, my head turned to watch it go down the hallway. The only thing I couldn't do was scream. <laughs> I was uh, terrified. Uh, yeah. You know, and then I immediately got up and ran to my parents' bedroom. Then suddenly I found my voice. Um, of course, they told me it was just a dream, but that was my first experience with a shadow person. I'm really um, curious about the position that they put your arms in. Did they do it like um, crossing your solar plexus or crossing your heart like you see in Egyptian mummies and things like that? It was, you know, and that's a, that's a good point. It would be more like you would see the Egyptian mummies. Uh, except I wasn't holding any, any scepters or rods. <laughs> so it would be more like that. That's very interesting. I wonder, like, was there any communication, either telepathic or otherwise? Not that I recall. Uh I don't recall any communication at all. I'm still baffled to this day as to what it was trying to do to me. I was just wondering if it thought that, you know, how when we're sleeping and or just in that near wake state, um, we're sort of out of body. You know, not completely, obviously, or we wouldn't come back, but, you know, tethered on a silver cord. And I wonder, right. I wonder, perhaps because you were just coming out of that state and it saw you and you were still still, if it thought maybe you had passed and was giving you some kind of honor, like we don't, you know, like respect or something. How did you feel when that's usually the key? That's, 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 an, interesting, scared. that's an interesting point. Uh, yeah, I was scared. And I, I mean, we're talking over 30 years ago. Um, sure, but I, it was really a really don't intense re- imprint, though. It so. was definitely, yeah, it was definitely intense. It was def- definitely impressive. I just don't recall anything else other than terror. Yeah, but but I but I I'm, I'm, am I right in thinking that you weren't sensing malevolence? It was more just not an experience you expected to have, or did you feel like it had ill intent? Um, you know, I I, I can't say that it had ill intent because I think if it had ill intent, it would have done something more uh-huh. uh huh than that. Um, it was certainly up to something you know, <laughs> yeah. doing this to me. I mean, my, my brain as a child was, you know, this is a stranger in my room. It has just touched me. Um, yeah. You know, so I felt, you know, I felt violated. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so. you would. It would be normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. I, I, 
I had an, a sighting of a fairy in my room, and it's very intense memory too. But it didn't try to cross my arms, so it wasn't okay. as interactive as that. So, wow, 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 wow. Well, um, so so then, what other experiences did you have? early on before you became officially or or maybe I should say what age did you start doing paranormal investigation with intent and and maybe share some experiences that led up to that point yeah my my first um paranormal investigation was when I was 16 years old and I had another um brief encounter with a shadow person when I was 13 it was just more of a curious story that one that one at 13 certainly had no ill intention. It was just um, one of those that would just kind of peek around the corner at us. We just moved into a new house. It would just kind of peek around the corner while we were unpacking things and then dart away. And after a few months, it it was no longer seen. So it just seemed to be either something passing or maybe it was something there and was checking us out, deemed that we were okay and mm-hmm. didn't bother us anymore. So that's why I always say there's different types of, of shadow people. I've, I've, you know, I've definitely observed them. Um, but yeah, my first uh, paranormal investigation was at the age of 16. Um, very impromptu, didn't really realize so much what we were doing other than, you know, I did have a uh, you know, interest in the paranormal um, and the afterlife. Um, and we were at a, uh, you know, myself and a buddy of mine, uh, we were at a friend's house. And she started telling us about how she thought that her bedroom was haunted. And she had an old cemetery behind her house, and you know, like an old family cemetery from those mm-hmm. that previously lived there. It was an old house um, in downtown. It was a small town. And apparently every time that she would put something up on her wall, you know, it would fall down. So she'd tack some, you know, with posters or mm-hmm. what have you up on the wall. And at some point in time, they would, fall. So we went up there and we started putting things on the wall and, um, you know, sure enough, a couple of those things fell after, after waiting a little while. Hmm. So, um, my, my buddy, he was, uh, a bit sensitive. And so he decided that he was going to put his hand on the wall and see if he could feel anything. And sure enough, he did. Hmm. Uh, He turned like a bright red, and started sweating profusely. Wow. Um, and then he just he took his hand off the wall. But that also prompted us to, you know, it's like, okay, that scared us for a second. But yeah. then we were curious, well, wait a second. Maybe there's other walls around here that do the same thing. So he started going wall to wall to kind of detect what the hot spots were. Oh. So it was kind of a kind of interesting uh, experience at 16 years old. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it is, I don't like to use the term scary, but sometimes it's the the proper word just because we're so startled that something that we expect, we don't expect appears from that other dimension. You know, it it isn't, it's, it is startling. And, um, and sometimes. Yeah, startling, I think is a better term for, I mean, because, you know, it's not fear. It's just, you know, we were shocked, startled, you know, what have you. Yeah, um, curious also, but sort of like, right. whoa, that's weird. <laughs> right, exactly. <Yeah. laughs> wow, wow. And um, and so what age you said that you thought, wh- when did you start getting seriously into the paranormal investigation in terms of equipment or or maybe even just... Uh, the term, I guess, would be ghost hunting. I, I always object um, to that Yeah, term. that's probably been, yeah, probably over the last I don't know, maybe dozen years. I mean, there was a little bit here and there before that. I was more into, um, you know, the research aspect and studying because um, I really didn't even know so much um, at that point that there were people that were actually out, uh, you know, investigating like that, you know, with all this different equipment, you know, I, you know, you kind of knew, okay, you know, you could record a spirit voice. So, you know, you sit there with a, you know, a real, real, real tape recorder or something. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, try to see if you could, you know, get anything, uh, you know, near what, you know, was purportedly a haunted location or, um, 
you know, you might try to, you know, take some photographs and, you know, see if you could catch an apparition or something like that. So there are, you know, different moments like that, but, you know, it really picked up over the last dozen years because it was, um, maybe even 15 because, um, I guess it was, you know, a lot of people point at, uh, it, it, you know, TV, of course, has really been you know, a big impact. Um, I think it was the, the internet um, that was even bigger because I think it kind of spurned those shows on. And, and people kind of forget Scariest Places on Earth was before Ghost Hunters. And I think that really sparked an even bigger interest. Because I remember going out to some of the old bulletin boards and forums uh, that we had, you know, Back around what 1998, 1999, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, it, it just really kind of uh, united people from across the country. And hey, I've had these different experiences. You know, you're talking about the show, mm-hmm. um, but you're like, hey, you know, I've had these different experiences. You've had these different experiences, and you start really to um, you know build a log um, and find you know similarities between each other and what you've experienced and you know, we started coming up with different definitions and some of some of the stuff had already been around, but we just didn't know, you know, you would have to find a library somewhere that maybe had a, you know, an old book or, you know, maybe somebody had read a little Hans Holzer, which I actually had uh, when I was 13 years old. So, you know, I knew a few things. Had a what? I'm um, sorry. It, it, uh, Hans Holzer. If you read, uh, he, he's the guy that actually termed the, uh, or according to the term ghost hunter, oh. uh, but he had, he had written uh, almost 150 books. Um, I had one, <laughs> but, well, um, you know, it was one is whatever more than you me could get your hands on back in the day. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said one is more than me at this time. It's okay. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I mean, back then we didn't have, we just, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have that way to be able to, you know, connect and share information. So if you're in a small town um, that, uh, you know, doesn't want to believe in those sorts of things. You're not going to be able to go to the library and find a lot of the different things you might be looking for. But being connected to the internet now, we're able to go anywhere and find that information now. Yes, it's it is an amazing media or medium <laughs> for that. You know, I I have to give you your props um, because uh, we discussed this in detail before you came on the show. One reason that I feel awkward with paranormal investigation in general is that people tend to go in sort of like spectators, kind of poking a stick and seeing what jumps out kind of thing. And that was not your modality at all. You've always addressed it with sincere curiosity, and you've really maintained a compassionate demeanor throughout the process and that really touched me because in working with spirits as a medium there's no way that I could consider it gratuitous fun to go listen in on the suffering of other people whether they're in this dimension or not so I, I want to give you uh, uh, praise for 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 the way that you've the integrity that you've approached it with I, I think it's extraordinary thank you and that is something that that bothers me with a lot of modern paranormal teams is that they've forgotten or maybe they just never, I don't know, maybe never really realize that, Hey, you know, <laughs> we're dealing with people here. You know, you, you can't see them like you can see me. Um, but these were people that once walked the earth as humans. And, you know, you wouldn't go barging into somebody's house and start ordering them around, you know, you know, knock on the doors and throw something around or to hit you, you just don't do that. You know, there's a, there's a certain respect that you have for people and their boundaries. And, you know, it doesn't change <laughs> now that they are in, uh, in a spirit form. Mm-mm. No, so you, 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 you maintain that respect. I'll go into a location. I'll introduce myself. I'll introduce, uh, those that are with me. I'll say, you know, Hey, this is, uh, Mike and Shauna, or hey, this is Mike, Dave, and David, but I'm out with Society of the Supernatural. And, you know, we, I just say, you know, it's a pleasure to meet you. We're just, you know, we're curious about you, um, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Yes, and, yes. Yeah. I know I had a, um, I used to own a restaurant in Christiansburg, Virginia, and when 
uh, my husband and I were living in the house, uh, renovating it. We would get up and renovate uh, in the mornings until we went to the restaurant that we worked at uh, that was his um, to, for the evening. Um, and and when we first moved in there, the building had been a Victorian, 1988 Victorian mansion. And um, it had been owned by the Parks and Rec Center for the town of Christiansburg. And we would sleep because we couldn't uh, find anyone that wanted to take the pool tables out of the upstairs for a while. So we would just toss a mattress on top of a pool table and sleep there. And um, both of us heard clear uh, footsteps uh, of, a, of someone that, by the sound of their uh, passing, uh, you know, would have probably been a female um, just because they weren't clomp, clomp, clomp. They were a lighter step, but down the hallway so clearly that we thought there was someone in the house. And this occurred two times, I think, before, and I, you know, I wasn't working as a medium and everything was just kind of a natural process for me at that time. Um, this was, oh, 15, 20 years ago, maybe. And, um, and so I just remember stepping out into the hallway after that second occurrence. And I got the impression of a petite, very short, uh, you know, how people were shorter in Victorian times. Right. I don't know if it was nutrition yeah. or whatever, but uh, in a black uh, Victorian dress walking down the hallway. And I just very quietly asked her, is it, is it all right if um, you not do that? Because we're here and we're actually trying to fix the home up and, mm -hmm. you know, and she never did it again, you know, well, yeah, very good. You, you know, yeah, so, so you're, just, you're very respectful and you, you ask, you know, what you would ask any normal human being. Yes. Yes. Well, we're already at the bottom of our hour. When we come back, I'd like to talk to you about sort of types of ghosts and interdimensional beings in general, and then get into some other topics, maybe talk about Haunted Road Media, etc. So we'll be back the other side of the hour, and thank you for listening. Welcome back. Uh, today we're talking with Mike Ricksecker. Uh, he is the author of Deadly Air, System of the Dead, Ghosts of Maryland, Ghosts and Legends of Oklahoma, Campfire Tales in the Midwest, and Ghostorian, Case Files, Volume 1. And thank you. It's been, uh, been a great ride so far. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. <laughs> well, we'll keep up the momentum. And I, I alluded to the fact that I'd be curious just briefly to cover maybe uh, with you some of the types of ghosts and interdimensional beings that you either categorize or have encountered. Sure. Well, I mean, we talked a lot about uh, shadow people. There's a you know variety of different ones that I've I've seen. Um, you know, a lot of times they're kind of just wispy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I will say I have not yet experienced a full body apparition, which is um, <laughs> you know, as a paranormal investigator, is kind of like you know, that's the thing you're always hoping to see. Um, but I have. I mean, I've seen a number of uh, like white wisps. I've actually, you know, popped those on camera. Um, some like white mists that have been there. I was just going to say, as a as someone who's very interested in providing concrete ed as evidence as a historian and as a paranormal investigator, you do differentiate defects from light effects on their camera. Mm -hmm. So when you say that you have this, I just want our listeners to know he's got it. <laughs> it's not a fake. <laughs> it's, you know, you're very meticulous. About, yes. Yes. Uh, I, I scrutinize that very carefully. Could you see that ball of light when with your naked eye or is it something that appeared? Oh, you you know, um, that, <laughs> I can't say that I that I did because that was um, it was at Black Bear Church and um, it was out in, out in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma and I had just walked up into the sanctuary uh, and I just boom snapped the snap the camera snap a, a picture and it was right there. Um, yes, it often is that way. It is often that way. 
Yeah, I, I think I scared it off because it never caught anything remotely close to that again the entire night. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm and I'm usually um, pretty. You said meticulous. I mean, when it comes to orb photography, um, you know, a lot of it turns out to be moisture, or dust, or what have you, but. Uh, this one in particular, and I've, and I've had a number of those types of pictures. So I was like, oh, throw them out, throw them out, throw them out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but this baby. one had its own yeah. illumination, too. I was like, Ooh. that one's real. Wow. That would definitely be a, one of the characteristics to look for internal or self-illumination. When you're doing research and you're looking back in history and looking at maybe legends or something like that, uh, where is that line that separates a legend from something in history, and how do you find that? Yeah, that's a uh, that is an excellent question. I was just speaking about that uh, this past weekend at a uh, conference at the Exchange Hotel in Virginia, and it's really kind of interesting um, how these legends develop. And you know, basically, a legend is you know a mixture of that real history and stories and fiction that have, um, you know, and maybe not even necessarily fiction, but may, it could be a mixture of two different types of truth that have combined to create a piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and an example that I like to give with that is the haunting of the Skirvin Hotel in Oklahoma City. And the story goes at this hotel that there was a uh, chambermaid, a chambermaid named Effie, who was the um, lover of W. B. Skirvin, who was the proprietor of the hotel when it first opened, and she became pregnant, and he didn't want anybody to know, didn't want the public to know, so he uh, put her up in the uh, penthouse on top floor of the hotel, her and the baby. Well, being isolated like that, she grew depressed and one day grabbed the baby and jumped out of the top story window mm -hmm. to the death of them both. And since then, people have heard uh, and seen the chambermaid throughout the hotel. People have heard cries of the baby down the hallways, uh, things of this nature. You've heard the rattling of the maid cart um, down the hall when there isn't any. Um, however, the problem is that there's no record of an Effie having ever existed. There's no account of any woman and a baby having jumped from the top story window of the hotel mm -hmm. um, to their death. That was, that's something that would be covered by the news, but there's no record of it. There's no news coverage, nothing. So where did the story of this woman come from? Well, in my research for my book, I dove pretty heavily into this to try to discover where the story came from. And what I found were a couple of different accounts um, of the hotel back in the 1930s. One was a, uh, a gentleman from Dallas. He was a traveling salesman. And he did actually jump from the top story window of the hotel and committed suicide. So that's the only death of that nature at that hotel. And there was another account a few years later of a woman who tried to, um, but she was grabbed by a security guard just in Kate, uh, just in time, and was um, she was ended up being charged like eleven dollars for drunkenness. So there's a woman who almost did. Uh huh. So you have these bits of truth, you know, real history of the hotel, combined with the experiences that people we're having with these hauntings of, you know, people really did see um, apparitions of chambermaids there. They really did hear the phantom maid carts down the hallways. They really did hear the um, cries of a baby upon the air when apparently there was no baby around. So they've combined, you know, the history and the experiences into this legend. Do you think it's, uh, not to dispute, just to play devil's advocate here, <laughs> mm -hmm. do you think it's sure. possible that because of her class, like being in a working servant class um, or her ethnicity, that that story would have been suppressed because of the owner's connection to her? Um, I mean, that's always a possibility, but... I kind of lean toward there would there should be at least 
some record. There's no, sure. there's not a death record. Uh, exactly. And even, um, even looking at some of the just, you know, newspapers at the time, um, you know, I went through the archives of Oklahoma and trying oh, to find her. Oh. <clears throat> and there were other, um, you know, deaths associated uh, in and around the hotel. And one, um, you know, was in, you know, African American man who was shot on the sidewalk just outside the hotel. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, they accounted for that. And granted, it was just like a little blip, like a small paragraph. Still noted, but though. They, mm-hmm. they still noted it. Yeah, so well, I if like... they're at least noting that, then somebody jumping off the building that everybody could see for <laughs> right, they you know, probably... along with baby. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And and I like the fact that you err on the side of caution or proof. Mm-hmm. You know, for what you do, that's incredible. And it's part of what makes you an expert in that field. You ended up um, helping on a case that was featured in The Haunted. Right. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, you know, our case was that I was uh, with the team OKPRI at the time. And I was uh, you know, the researcher for the team. So while you know, we all investigated uh, the house. Um, it was my duty to also, you know, try to research the house and see what kind of uh, history and backstory I could, you know, discover. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, basically what was going on at this home was the uh, the daughter, and she was, she was a grown daughter. She was, I think she was like 21, 22 or something like that. Um, so she was experiencing this uh, dark, malevolent type entity in her bedroom, primarily in her closet, and she would frequently see red eyes. Um, that, is scary. that is scary. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary. And the rest of the family also experienced different things around the house. Things moving around. Uh, they would experience uh, shadows. The, uh, uh, the son, who was the eldest child, and had already moved out. Um, when he lived there, he described um, this incident where he woke up in the middle of the night and heard all this thrashing around going going on in his room. Things were getting knocked over. He described it as a wrestling match that he couldn't see. So there were a lot of things going on in this house over the years. And so we came in, we did five, six investigations before um, the haunted picked us up for this, uh, for this episode. We ended up doing it a cleansing of the house on the episode. Um, but what I discovered in my research of the house was that um, the original homeowner also had his father living in the house with them. And that father uh, committed suicide in that back bedroom where the daughter was sleeping at the time that we oh, did the investigation. Oh, wow, wow, yeah. Yeah, so there was some bad energy from there. And then the the actual homeowner himself uh, attempted suicide during an argument that he and his wife were having one day, and he was unsuccessful um, in his attempts to severely injure himself um, in the process. Um, there was a that that was all documented. There was another story um, that we could not confirm, however, and if I recall correctly, they did actually air it on the episode. So I was. I was a little myth as I kept trying to go down that route, but uh-huh. there was a re- there was a retired police officer uh, in the area, it was you know elderly man, and he said that you know at that house um, they had been called out one day to um, because there was a, a boy who had uh, accidentally asphyxiated himself uh, in the closet, um, but we again we were not able to find any sort of, uh, of record of anyone having done that. Yeah. We just had this guy's story. <laughs> Granted, right. he had been a police officer, um, and so you'd like to believe him, but i like to back that up with something. And it could yeah, be. if you're going to present it as fact, it's, it's another level of um, criteria there. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Did you know, so did things be, you know how sometimes you have the movie and you've got the book and they're a little bit different. Does life experience differ when it gets put onto, you know, mainstream media? Oh yeah. 
you know, our our episode wasn't so bad. I, I've seen a lot of um, paranormal television out there that greatly differs from the real experience. And you hear stories about how you know something was portrayed, you know, on a particular um, you know episode, and you know it was far from what really happened. Or you hear about some of the shows faking some of their evidence. Um, with our show, I mean, it was pretty much spot on. There are a couple small things that I just didn't quite understand. Um, the biggest of which was that, um, you know, they showed some footage of us sitting down in the, in the bedroom and, uh, and running an EVP session, which we did. We sat in that bedroom, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> doing an EVP session. And we've done that a number of times. We've got all kinds of EVPs. And uh, that's that EVP house. is an, uh, electronic, electronic voice phenomenon. Yeah, electronic so, voice phenomenon. Just clarifying yeah. for someone who might right. not be there. Right. Um, so, what they ended up playing during that spot was an EVP that we got that said die. However, that wasn't where we got that EVP. We did get EVPs during that session, mm. just not that one. And where we got that EVP was actually another piece of footage that they showed in which we were doing the cleansing of the house. We had um, Carl Johnson was out there, and he was doing a blessing. And uh, Talison, the girl, had come into the house. We told the family to stay outside. So she came in the house to use the restroom, and we ended up finding her in the master bedroom talking at something against the wall. Um, so he decided to um, you know, do a... Well, we we're going to do a blessing over the room anyway, but then to do a blessing over her. And when he started this, she doubled over. She doubled over in pain and fell to the floor, mm. out for like a few seconds, and we helped her to the bed. But it was when she doubled over in pain that we got that EVP that said "die." Mm. And to this day, I don't understand why they did not put that EVP there because it's so much more powerful in that moment. Oh yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, because it's related. It's connectable. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm kind of curious. You said you have videos on Haunted Road Media. Uh, oh, no. Uh, uh, YouTube. Over 200 on Haunted Road Media. Over 200. Um, 200. Oh, my yeah. gosh. No, a lot of them, a lot of them are, are video blogs where I'm kind of, you know, driving around talking and doing my thing. Maybe talking about paranormal stuff, maybe not. But I have um, a lot of different um, paranormal shows that I've, you know, put out there. Uh, there's a Ghosts and Legends uh documentary show that um you know it's it has a lot of the history and things like that there's a paranormal roads which is um it's, it's a paranormal road trip uh series and it's, you know me driving out to different investigations and to different locations historic locations doing uh, uh investigations so you've got like this that. grouped on your youtube channel so if people have a intense interest in one or the other they can yeah. kind of find them more easily that's yeah, big. they're all on playlists. So you can go to the Friday Night Ghost Frights playlist, and you know that one's more of me telling ghost stories, um, true ghost stories. But um, yeah, there's there's all kinds of different ones out there. What you know? Describe what Haunted Road Media is uh, for yeah. for people. Yeah, Haunted Road Media is a publishing and video production company. So I have two sides to that. Uh, the one side is a book publishing company, and I have about a half dozen authors that I've helped to publish now, and a couple more uh, coming up here. And, you know, uh, a lot of it is, uh, you know, their own personal uh, paranormal experiences. Uh, I do have one, uh, Vanessa Holgo, who's a remote viewer, so her book Soulscapes um, mm. contains a lot of drawings um, that she's uh, created over there, her her years of different things that she's seen and the stories that go along with it. Um, yeah, so there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of different experiences. One is Revelations of a Paranormal Pastor, so that one, Paul, is, uh, um, cool. he, he's a pastor, but he's kind of, you know, been involved with the paranormal as well. Yeah, um, so, like, if somebody is writing something in the paranormal genre, if they wanted to publish through Haunted Road Media, what would you tell them? Um, I would just tell them to contact me through the the website when you know, whatever comes back online today, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know just kind of give me a, a a brief rundown, a brief synopsis of uh, what you're interested in publishing, and you know maybe a little piece of uh, sample writing, and uh, you know, we'll take it from there. 
see if cool. it's a good fit. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. What are your projects? What's next? <laughs> well, as far as uh, Hot Rod Media and the, on the publishing side, I'm, I'm finishing up on uh, Lee Ehrlich's book, A Master of the Abyss. He has a lot of interesting experiences. He's done a lot of underwater uh, paranormal investigations. So he's, he's primarily a deep he's primarily been in deep sea salvage, but he's oh, had a lot of experiences. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, well down there. So uh, there's there's that that's coming up, and then on the uh, the video production side, I'm, I'm always doing about two to three different uh, videos per week. Wow, uh, that's an intense yeah. schedule. It is. It is very intense, but I've been able to keep up on it. And then, of course, I'm always doing my own research and writing, so I have some other books that works here. Oh, that's wonderful. Mike, I just want to thank you so much for joining us. I've never had a ghost story in on the show before. <laughs> thank you. Oh, my goodness. If you would like to find Mike, you can find him at hauntedroadmedia.com or look on YouTube, Haunted Road Media there too, right, Mike? Yes, yes, and please subscribe. <laughs> okay, oh yes, please subscribe, absolutely. It means a lot to those of us that put that energy into our work. Well, thank you again, and I enjoyed the show. I hope everyone listening did as well. I thank you for joining us, and um, we'll see you next week for another episode of From a Medium's Perspective. And please remember, it's never inappropriate to be kind, and without integrity, you have nothing. <laughs>